Welcome to API Days Helsinki. I'm here with Alan Gnabe, who has uh, something very interesting to share with us about his experience, about the remote times that we are all living. What did you have in mind, Alan? Well, it's pretty simple, really. I was uh, I got up this morning and I realized I needed to, to iron a shirt. So I got a shirt out and I started to iron it. And I was like, I haven't done this in months, you know? I started to think about like all the uh, the time savings that uh, I've made over the last few months in ironing shirts is just like the tip of the iceberg, right? So the amount of time and effort we put into getting to the workplace and, and, and all that stuff, travel, you know, and all that time we save then can put into other things, you know, you put it into your work, into your family, uh, wherever you want. So that's uh, that's what I've seen. That is so true, but I have to say some of our uh, women speakers have been like saying that, hey, you should really make an effort each morning <laughs> to, so that you feel like you're going to work. So there seems to be these two different mindsets going on. <laughs> But I have to well. say, I completely agree with you. <laughs> okay, so uh, now that your shirt is ironed, I'm sure that you're ready to go with your speech. And what are you going to tell us today? Okay, um, I'm going to talk to you today um, about your API portal, and specifically why your API portal is so bad, or if we're being honest, why it sucks, uh, and what you can do about it. Um, so, this is me, I'm Alan Canale, and uh, I founded a company recently called API Able. So, the idea is that you become API Able, and uh, we help you with your API products consulting, and we also uh, develop API portals. Um, I have about 20 years' experience uh, of working across many different uh, industries. Uh, from uh, manufacturing, pharmaceutical, banking, financial, um, a lot of different uh, larger organizations uh, over the years. So um, let's get straight into it then. Um, why does your developer portal suck so much? Now, if you're a uh, regular company and you have already a developer portal up and running, you can go ahead and look at your statistics for the, the previous month or this month, and you'll probably find it's something like this, right? So uh, the total number of new registrations is extremely low. People aren't really engaged with the portal. They're not really signing up for it. Or when, when they do sign up for it, you can see, for example, um, there's a lot of like internal company uh, developers who are logging on just to see how it works, for example, or they're, they're probably uh, consultants from um, third party Developers who you're paying to develop stuff with your APIs who are logging in and, and you haven't got so many of these like external developers that uh, you, you were promised to get. Um, let's dig into some of the reasons why this, this might be the case, right? So I, I came up with so many reasons I had to sort of like try and cut them down. <laughs> so um, Let's look at the first obvious one is kind of branding. So a lot of the time you, you maybe put your, your logo on and choose your colors from your, your company onto an uh, off the shelf API portal. And uh, it might not always look that good, right? So it's when you see your, someone from your marketing department and you start to hide that you know you have uh, problems with your, your API portal. I've also seen quite a few times that um, people put them on different domains. So. Uh, if you have yourcompany.com, they put them on yourcompany'sapis.com, so uh, it, it doesn't lead to a lot of trust. Uh, so branding is, is quite a, a big one. Uh, onboarding is also a, another one. You know, the case where it takes over a week for um, someone to get access to an API. So it could just be simply the fact that you have an approval process in place and the person approving has gone on vacation for two weeks, for example. Uh, or it's more likely that uh, your internal IT team has to do some work to, to onboard uh, that developer. Um, for example, if you have back-end legacy systems and you need to create accounts, you probably have to create service requests, et cetera, to, to get that done. And it, it just takes time. And it probably points at the fact that you don't have um, APIs as a product, you have APIs as a solution, uh, which is a completely different thing. Legacy, so um, another thing is that, you know, a lot of these API portals are starting to, to age now. Uh, and what was like, you know, trendy maybe 10, 15 years ago, 
uh, is now getting you know targeted as a, uh, a risk by security. Uh, it's come up in the order a few times to say, okay, um, you need to sort this out. You need to start patching this uh, this legacy software. Uh, and also, you know, you've created your original API portal before GDPR, and now there are some things uh, you may need to do in order to to close that loophole so security don't uh, start talking to you. Um, this is a little bit of an off-the-shelf thing we, we have here. Um, no integration to the rest of your organization. So you have a developer portal. You, you force the customer to register again, even though they probably already have an existing uh, registration with your company that you could use, single sign-on. Um, and you also don't understand, okay, who the customer is. You don't understand, okay, what assets they have, if it's like a physical thing like a SIM card, uh, or if, you know, what kind of contracts they have with you, your existing organization. You don't know anything about the customer. And I'll come back to this towards the end of the presentation as well. And, and this is the one I really want to talk to you about uh, today. It's more the um, product side of things as well, um, where you, you can't scale your current API product offering, right? So the sales are quite poor of the products that you do have, and your customers can't just understand the products, you have to explain them beforehand, right? And a lot of this comes around the fact that, you know, how well do you know your customer? And so the starting point is to ask, okay, well, actually, who is your customer? Pretty obvious, really, developers, 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 right? So you bought a developer portal, you set it up, um, you have great developer experience on the portal. You're probably planning to do some hackathons. You have great developer documentation. It's all about the developer, right? And this, this is true if your API products are targeting developers. So here's a couple of example companies. So we have Stripe, who are a um, credit card uh, payment provider. Um, they have some of the best API documentation um, you've ever seen. Go and check that out. It's lovely. Um, they've done very well with the developers because it's very well explained and very clear how to get going. Twilio, likewise, they have a lot of um, API products that are targeted towards developers. Um, they understand developers very well. They know how they think and um, they create great um, API products for, for developers. And these are a couple of like just two of the benchmarks that you, you work against when you're creating a developer portal. So of course, if you're treating your APIs as products, which you should be doing, you have API products, um, one of the first things that comes up then is to say, okay, well, which market segment um, are we targeting with these products, right? Who are the target customers and users? Two, two very important things to identify your target customers and users. And you might come up with a statement like, our target market is farmers in emerging markets who live in rural areas etc right so that probably doesn't apply to you directly but uh, you're going to have a similar uh, statement about who your target market is right um again to come back to there's two very important words like customer and user right we really need to differentiate between the two at this point in time and say okay a customer is someone who pays for your product a user does not a user is a user of the system they come after a customer has purchased the product Okay, and that, that's important because I, I think that we're failing to differentiate between the two a lot of the time, right? If we look at your existing portal today, if you have one, or if you're looking around on the internet at other people's portals, um, we can already have a look at that and see, okay, what's the target market for, for these API products? So maybe this is something you wanna do offline, but to give you a rough idea, if the uh, developer say can come to your develop a portal with a credit card, can see a list of products and understand the features and plans and can immediately get access to those APIs. And no one is forcing them to do this. They have their own free will. If they can come to your site, just get access to their APIs, then you probably have um, identified developers as your target customer group, right? So it means that a developer can come along and start using the APIs within five, 10 minutes, they're, they're off, right? So think of something, quite a simple product like uh, sending an SMS or text message. On the flip side, if you're um, forcing your customers to pay via an invoice, if you have more like enterprise sales, so there's um, ambiguous pricing, 
Um, if a legal contract needs to be signed before developers get access to the API, if the developer themselves are being paid by an organization in order to access the APIs, then it probably hints at that your API products are not um, usable directly by a developer. And the developer is probably not your target customer in this case. Again, very important to differentiate between the two. The developer is probably not your target customer, especially if you fall into that latter group. The customer is probably the one you already know. Meaning that if you're an organization and you're making millions in sales every year, or maybe even billions in sales every year, um, that is your customer. That's the customer you should be uh, looking to serve with your API products. So with that in mind, if you, if you take some time here to um, put yourself into the shoes of your customer and say, okay, well, go ahead and have a look at the uh, developer portal you already have up and running. And from their perspective, see how it looks, right? And they'll probably be hitting the back button, right? Uh, it, it's not for them. It, it's, um, it's for developers. And, and as a customer, you're not gonna understand a developer portal immediately, you know, the fact that it's got developer dot in the domain name is a definite hint for them, right? So it, it's not for them. Um, so at this point, you might be having some objections, right? You might say, yes, we know this, but uh, we have separate marketing pages for the customer, right? So this is something I see quite often, is that organizations, they have developer portal, onboarding for the developers, et cetera, and then for the customer themselves, they they begged marketing for a couple of pages in the internet. Uh, and they got them, and, and sometimes these pages are pretty good. They describe, okay, the value proposition of what you're hoping to achieve uh, and get the customer interested. But what I see more often than not is that these marketing pages are toothless, right? There's no call to action. There's, there's nothing that a customer can really do to get hold of this digital solution immediately other than you know contacting a local sales rep or, or even worse redirecting to your developer portal we've seen how that looks um, it also leads to disjointed experience um, for the for the customer as a whole so you have your customers uh, on, on one website and they're you know speaking to sales reps or filling in contact forms and your developer is somewhere else uh, not really understanding what the customer conversation has been so far you can also say, okay, we have salespeople who sell our products. Okay, um, but if your sales rep is selling paper, they're not gonna understand what an API is or a digital product. Uh, and even if you have a technical sales rep, uh, they might not be incentivized or, or care about selling your, your product. And um, yes, it's a valid sales channel, but it shouldn't be your, your primary sales channel in this case, in my opinion. And of course, you know, the whole Netflix generation, you know, if, if they actually have to like pick up a phone, talk to someone, fill in a six page PDF in order to get access to something, um, they're probably not gonna do it, right? They expect um, to be able to buy a Tesla via their mobile phone, for instance, right? Very expensive product. They're, they're willing to just, you know, buy it because they want it. And your digital product should be no exception. So we've spoken a little bit about portals and, and now I'd like to sort of come in, you know, briefly into, into the API product world and say, okay, so if I've now identified the customer, if you don't necessarily have customer facing products, what should you be building? So here we have quite a, quite a busy slide on the left, but I just want to point out like the three different um, uh, segments we have here. So first of all is your, your core, this is your existing um, product that your company sells. So it, it could be, uh, you know, a car, it could be paper, whatever. It's your existing products that you sell. Uh, on the flip side, you've got transformational um, products um, that are something completely new. They, they, they don't exist yet. They, they might disrupt your, your core business uh, and that's up there and then adjacent, it sits in between. It, so it's um, business that's new to the company. So it's, it's something new, but not too far away from it. So you might be thinking that it's your job in the API program to create a transformational product. Something that's completely different, new, new revenue models, new brand new products for the company. I would say in the first instance, um, don't, don't go completely disruptive, right? 
Uh, the main reason is that you're, you're entering to the world of startups. It's, it's exciting world, but you know, most startups fail uh, and you will too, right? If you try to come up with something crazy, chances are you're going to fail and you can't afford to do that. So on the flip side, you might say, okay, let's go down to the core then uh, and start working here against the core products we already have. Um, I would also advise against that because you'll get bogged down in bureaucracy. You know, it's bad when you're spending, you know, you've got these three hour project management meetings, uh, which are <laughs> deadly boring, but you have to sit in them and then you get told eventually, yes, we can do it in 2025. Right. So uh, you want to spend as little time as possible with the guys in core sweet spot is somewhere here on the adjacent. Um, what you want to do is you want to be talking about um, solving your customers existing pain by creating new solutions, new products there in that adjacent part. So you're going to be going out, you're going to be talking to the customers. Ideally, if not, you can be talking to account managers, existing product managers, and you're going to be trying to find out, okay, what are the pain points that our customers have using our current products? And then you're going to try and come up with a, uh, a solution, a digital product, which solves that pain for your customer. So when we're talking about coming back to the portal, so, so, so what can we really do about it? What, what can we do in order to um, make a better API portal, an API portal for your customer? So your customers want less technical details. They prefer products, um, they're, they're comfortable with products, they've seen them around, they, they buy products all the time, they don't understand what an API is or uh, any of these technical things, they want less of it, they want more of a marketplace approach, that's the whole thing of uh, viewing a product catalog, seeing uh, some product videos for example, features, price lists, being able to sign up for a subscription, uh, all of these things that they uh, know and love today. Uh, no brainer really, if, you're, if you already have a uh, relationship with your customer where they log in and can see their contracts, et cetera, then continue to do it. Use the same identity provider. Don't um, take something else where you create a silo of, of customers uh, of your own. Integrate your CRM. So this is something I touched on earlier as well, is to say, okay, well, again, if you're building API products which are quite close to your um, existing core products, um, bring them up. Um, you know, an example here could be, for example, maybe it's a, a you have a fleet cars and you want your customers to be able to track those cars by GPS, and that's your digital product. So, effectively, you can show a customer um, a list of their 100 cars in their organization fleet, and then say, okay, well now, to which one of these do you want to assign this digital product? For example. Off the payment services your customers used to. Again, a no-brainer. So you want to be integrating into your SAP system, for example, to do invoicing or providing credit card if that's what they're used to using. You want to invite the developers at the right time, not forgetting the developers, but you want to bring them in after all of the paperwork is done. The contract has been signed, and uh, then you want to be inviting in the developer. And this is also an interesting one as well, it is where you maybe have a customer and you have partners. So you have a, an ecosystem between, between the, the three of you and you want to be able to allow your customer to give, um, to give access to certain external partners. Uh, an example here could be, for example, you've got um, a hotel chain and they want to allow a company with robots to move around and use the elevators in, in the building. Um, so you can do that, but the, the customer will probably want to say, okay, but only this hotel and actually only this elevator, the service elevator, the robot can't use the same elevator as the customers, for example. Um, and, and you should be allowing the customer to, to have that, um, to set that up without having to send emails and things like this. They should have it directly in their own system. Again, we're not forgetting the developer. I think the, the main point here is that it, it's an equal, equally balanced system. You've got customers on the one side uh, and you've got their developers. And the developers, they want less marketing BS. They prefer to hear about APIs, the products. It's the exact opposite of the, the customer in this case. Um, you need to start thinking about how you can offer a team construct for this. Too often we find that the API keys are on an individual 
developer basis. And then we find that developer uh, maybe takes a six month cruise around the world and is the only one who had access to the API key, not an ideal situation. Um, so you need like an organization and team construct within your, your API portal for your developers. You also have the opportunity here is to create um, you know, more dynamic documentation for the developer. So when, when the customer has signed the contract, has a subscription in place, understands, okay, um, <clears throat> what they want, you, you can have documentation which clearly describes for the developer, okay, to this API, this set of features, which means these methods, uh, and if there's any like rate limiting or anything for the developer that, you know, it's very clear for them uh, what they can and can't develop against. And then all the usual stuff, you know, the API key and secret, callback URL, and it's bound to the subscription, which is shared across a team, for example. Um, that's, that's the kind of stuff we're, we're looking at. So that, that's more or less it from me. Uh, I'd like to ask you at this point in time, you know, if that resonated with you, um, even if it didn't resonate with you, um, or maybe it did a little bit, then please drop me a line. I'm very interested in your feedback at this point in time. And if it really resonated with you, if you're so excited that you can't contain yourself, but we are running an early adopter program um, with three customers where we're looking to co-create this. We've already started, but we would really like to have some customers now to, to, to build this out with. So if you're thinking of building an API portal in the near future, then get in touch and uh, maybe we can co-create something together. And, you know, if you can contain yourself still and want to see a demo of what we've done so far, that's also absolutely fine. So you can get in touch with us by the website, which is uh, ABLE, API ABLE, and it's on the integration domain IO. Uh, there's some contact forms there, for example, or, you know, you can give me a call, that's possible. Uh, you can send me an email, you can tweet at me, see me on LinkedIn, or even uh, I use WhatsApp. I'm, I'm young and trendy, I can use WhatsApp. So, uh, yeah, that's about all from me. Thank you very much. It was really great to see uh, the presentation because I can totally say from experience that all of those things are most commonly either not fully developed, but also somehow wrong. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and for example, that kind of contract specific documentation is, one of those things that when you have a massive API, that really starts to be an issue for the developers to understand. But uh, so how would you say like, if, if we have already somebody who has uh, an API management solution and has already a developer portal with like some technology, then what would this kind of, how, how would this all work with that? Like, do they need to redo everything or, or is there like some way to transition? Well, pretty much. If, if you're taking um, one of these developer portals that, that comes bundled with your API management solution, they, they more or less just fit that one uh, scenario. That's having a developer as a customer, right? Mm -hmm. This is what we can see, you know, the, the developer logs in, gets the API keys, and, and that's about it. That, that's only like one half of the story is what I'm trying to say. Um, it, it is possible to extend that. Um, for example, you know, the new Microsoft portal, uh, you, you can download the portal and extend it as much as you like. So you could use it as a starting point and uh, hire some developers and develop it out. It's probably going to be quite expensive though. Um, the, the solution we're building basically will work with any API management vendor because they all have uh, open uh, APIs to allow us to do that. And, uh, and, and we're building it from the ground up to work exactly as I've just described, right? So it's an equal mm -hmm. relationship for your customers and developers. So um, it, it's probably best to give us a call. Yeah, and, and the hardest part, I think, of, and maybe you have experience about this is like, well, maybe to get the IT guys to believe that the marketing guys should be involved, but to get the marketing guys <laughs> to be involved in all of this, because once you start to, to speak about real customers, not just some developers or something, and you start calling them products, those APIs, so kind of how do you see the relationship with marketing and sales with this? 
Yeah, I, I mean, as it is today, so, so in my experience as well, the, the marketing guys kind of look at this and say, okay, uh, well, what's an API? Uh, why should we be interested in this? We, we, we produce tractors. This is nothing to do with us. And uh, so to the marketing guys, they are coming around more and more. I think now is the, the exactly the right timing. I think APIs are coming out of like this hype cycle. And now we're entering this period of like, you know, real proper growth for, for, for APIs and digital products. So I think it's becoming easier to talk with marketing and the business about this stuff. But also, you know, if, if you approach them with a solution which is customer centric and, and customer mm -hmm. focused and they understand their customers and go, oh, okay, well, you know, it's about the customer and the developer is a part of that journey, then, then they can live with that. And it's simple things like, you're not gonna use the developer dot domain you're going to use something else. Like um, uh, at Swisscom, we use uh, digital dot yeah. instead. Or right? like partners, partners yeah. dot something or something else. So yeah, right. I mean, like I think that that is a really key important difference for us all to understand because we have just been told that, hey, it's developers dot something or it's like API dot something. And that has been the paradigm so far. So. I think exactly. that, yeah, and then you have this little link in the footer of the main website, which says API. <laughs> so this right. kind of turns it up upside down. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do here is really challenge yeah. the status quo on that and say, okay, yeah, everyone's just accepted developers, developers, developers. Uh, and now I think it's time to have another look at that, basically. Yeah. Good. Refreshing points of view, I'm sure, for everybody. And thanks for being here, Alan. You Bye. Bye-bye.